this session, uh, we'll talk about global sensitivity analysis, which is a very important uh, method in uncertainty quantification, since it allows us to understand well or better the relationship between both between data model and prediction. There are many uh, techniques uh, for doing such global sensitivity analysis, but before covering global sensitivity analysis, I'd like to talk about local sensitivity analysis. So what is sensitivity analysis? Well, sensitivity analysis is a study basically where you vary uncertain input parameters and you try to understand how that results in variation of some response of interest. This response of interest can be anything. It could be a, a data variable and it could be a prediction variable. So in that sense, sensitivity analysis allows us to reduce uncertainty in predictions because it allows us to identify those input parameters that are affecting uh, those predictions and thereby identifying possibly some data that we need to acquire to reduce uncertainty on those parameters. It also allows us to reduce the complexity of a problem by identifying parameters that have very little influence on the prediction and thereby, thereby we can start to simplify uh, the problem by either removing those or resetting those in, uh, uh, parameters that have little influence to some fixed value. It also allows us to understand and quantify how what effects of combination of parameters. And when we're dealing with nonlinear systems or nonlinear functions, like most of the say the uncertainty quantifications that we're doing, and the kind of forward models that we're dealing with, um, those nonlinear variations in responses are very common. And so, therefore, in those kind of systems, we have what is called interactions. And so, we'll cover this idea of interactions in great detail. As a side note. Um, we should say that uh, there's no really unique way of doing sensitive analysis. So, for example, if you say there's desensitivity analysis, then actually that would refer to a particular method. And each method uh, allows us to study something different. And it's also probably important to understand what method can be used for what type of uh, situation and application. So, here's an example of a student uh, slide I got in the class uh, for. Understanding what is the variation of dose um, in terms of radioactive material that people would get over time when considering nuclear repositories. And so in doing so, people model a lot of processes, processes uh, of uh, that would involve, involve transport, flow, um, reactions, geochemistry, etc. And so we end up with an extremely complicated nonlinear system. But at the output, there's something really very simple. It's a function over time. So what we'd like to understand with sensitivity analysis is how does all complicated input, uh, what really matters there and what are the interactions that are needed to understand in order to understand the final uh, performance measure here. There are many different classes of sensitivity analysis, but for the sake of this course, we'll talk about local sensitivity analysis and global sensitivity analysis. In local sensitivity analysis, we actually start from some base case. It could be the mean of the parameters or we can build a single model um, where we do the best uh, we can to build that model um, given the information we have. Then once we have such model or such base case, we basically evaluate what happens if I make perturbations of such model. Of, uh, such model. And so perturbations can be done in many uh, fashions. For example, you can calculate partial derivatives of the forward response function uh, given, of course, that we are in the base case uh, scenario. We may have uh, many base case scenarios and evaluate sensitivity on those. In global sensitivity analysis, we essentially forget about this base case scenario and just say we're going to do Monte Carlo on the input parameters, uh, run the model many times on all those various um, input parameters drawn from some prior distribution, and then um, evaluate those models and try to understand uh, the multivariate distribution of the output that's being created due to the variation of the input parameters. So the challenges of a GS, uh, GSA and geosciences or uncertainty quantification, of course, is that the models are very high dimensional, uh, many uncertain input parameters, and that the responses may also be high dimensional. Typically, for evaluating responses such as forward models and making predictions, there are large computation times. The nonlinearity of the problem uh, is quite uh, substantial and, um, and existing. And also what's quite unique in our cases is that we have spatial aspect of the model. So there's a spatial distribution, for example, of hydraulic connectivity or permeability or porosity um, or even layering uh, that needs to be taken into account because that also may have a considerable influence on the, uh, on the response. 
And that's the problem a bit. How do you quantify essentially influence of spatial variability, which is not a simple variable on some kind of response? To illustrate that, we'll cover uh, a simple case. Uh, it's a case where, uh, where essentially we have a setup here, which is described by this figure, where we have uh, a river uh, and we extract a riv uh, water from that river, um, basically put an infiltration basin such that the, the, the river water can be purified uh, through the groundwater system and extracted out of an extraction well that's uh, close by. And so thereby uh, we get uh, more, we get purified drinking water uh, in order to do that, or it's a way of removing contaminants. So the problem, however, is that there may be some industrial or other area that has potential contamination. So if we therefore shut down the, the infiltration basin, what will happen is that uh, water will uh, eventually make itself to the extraction well. So the question is, um, how long does that take? Uh, to get there and what is influencing that. And so globally, of course, we can understand that the system is described by a, basically the geology, which is the hydraulic connectivity variation in the subsurface, as well as the boundary conditions, which have to do with boundary flow towards this river here. To illustrate some of the, comp, uh, con, uh, so illustrate then uh, this point is that uh, in this particular case, we have many uncertainties. As I mentioned before, there are two basic uncertainties, one related to the hydro connectivity and the other related to the boundary conditions. In the book, you'll find a, uh, a quite substantial table with many uncertainties. And so here we focus basically on only four parameters, uh, or six parameters. Four parameters related to hydraulic connectivity, such as mean, mean connectivity, variance connectivity, and parameters related to spatial correlation of connectivity, conductivity. And then we also have boundary conditions, uh, such as gradients and um, the variations of boundary condition. So what we uh, can do is then Monte Carlo and generate many realizations uh, and calculate, for example, the arrival time of pollutant. So that would be the Monte Carlo approach and that would also be global sensitivity analysis. We can also think now of what are methods of local sensitivity analysis. So there are basically two techniques. Uh, they are called one at a time analysis and which is commonly applied in many situations and the Morris method. So both are very simplified approaches. Um, they are quite useful in what they called screening and quite useful uh, because they, they require only a small number of model ev evaluations. However, it's very difficult to draw very general conclusions out of these uh, methods since there are a number of drawbacks uh, that uh, exist when applying this to the kind of problems you're interested in. So what's the one at a time analysis? So in the case of our Pollution case, um, the one at a time analysis would simply mean that we take a base case. We basically take the mean of all the parameters. So we remember we had uh, six or five or six parameters. Uh, and we would vary those, uh, we would basically fix them to the mean, run the base case. And then we may make uh, some deviations on those parameters. Uh, for example, I take the deviation, some 10% change on the mean probability while fixing all the other parameters. So it's very important to fix all the other parameters. And I run two more. Uh, cases, so in this case, two more flow simulations. In other words, we record what the influence is of that parameter. And so here in, in the blue, we see for the, key, for the mean, of course, is that our arrival time uh, will decrease as the mean increases. That's what we see over here. So our arrival time will, uh, sorry, arrival time will decrease, of course, when we increase the permeability um, and, and vice versa. We, then we can rank all these things. We do that for each parameter. We can rank all those parameters uh, essentially from uh, the biggest influence to the smallest influence. We get this kind of tornado chart. And so uh, for some, of course, the, the blue will be on the other side. It has the opposite effect. So the, the nice thing about that, of course, is that um, uh, this is very rapid to do. It, it requires only uh, two times five plus one flow simulation. So that will be very rapid to do. The problem, of course, is uh, with this method is that by fixing, uh, we're not studying interactions, uh, and that's something we'll, we'll come back later. There's also this idea is that the base case is the center, is the average of the response. So the average of the parameters give me some kind of average response. Uh, and of course, that's not, case in non not, not the case in nonlinear systems. 
The other thing is that we can't really deal with discrete parameters um, because they can be perturbed by some percentage. An additional problem, of course, happens when we're dealing with spatial uncertainty. Uh, in other words, in the DNAPO case, that contamination case, what I had to do is create a map of hydraulic connectivity given the geostatistical parameters that were provided to me. So if I change that, but there are many maps I can create because there's a spatial uncertainty. So if I change this map, uh, for example, I use map A, uh, map one for, uh, for one sensitivity and one map to a repeated sensitivity, then what we notice here is that the sensitivity is changing. For example, uh, for one particular spatial answer, uh, map, I get uh, very low sensitivity on the variance of hydraulic connectivity, and the other, I get very high sensitivity on the variance. So that means essentially that um, the spatial uncertainty also matters. And then potentially the spatial uncertainty, is, uh, as, as we see here, is interacting with this global parameter uncertainty. And so uh, we have to be very careful in applying these one at a time analysis or any kind of analysis that uh, does not uh, include some effect of the spatial uncertainty of the model itself. That brings us then to the Morris method. The Morris method is an extension of the one at a time uh, analysis or the science. Remember that in the one at a time analysis, we just take one single base case, often the mean of parameters, and we make perturbations around that. So here in the Morris method, we're going to do some kind of randomization. So that's illustrated conceptually, at least in that simple figure here. So what we notice is in, in a, uh, a one-on-time analysis, we take a base case and then we make perturbations uh, on parameters, possibly also in various directions. So in the Morris method, we're going to uh, do that, but over L trajectories. So instead of having just uh, one single base case, we now have L base cases where we're going to make these perturbations. So based on those perturbations, then we calculate what is called the elementary effect. So in an elementary effect, for example, we look at some case uh, here and we take a perturbation in X while remaining while X1 while remaining X2 constant. Here we take a perturbation uh, in X2 while re X1 remains constant. And so that allows us to calculate uh, this uh, elementary effect. And that perturbation is somewhat a function of how well you want to discretize uh, this interval in X1 and X2. And there are some rules related to that. So that uh, allows us then to calculate these elementary effects. And these elementary effects allow us to get more insight into the sensitivity analysis. So we can now calculate the, um, the, the absolute value, the mean absolute value of these, um, the mean of the absolute value, sorry, of these elementary effects and, this, and, their, and their variance. So it's very clear that if you have a large mean, that means that for many of these points, uh, we have a, a large change in the, uh, elementary effect, and so a large mean would indicate that that uh, response is uh, affected by perturbing that parameter. A large variance, however, would then indicate something uh, of what is called nonlinear interacting effects. So if, if, if indeed you have a large mean, but, the, but in addition to that, uh, the variance is, is large, it means that for different points you get different uh, elementary effects. It also means that, that, uh, that these uh, sensitivity are dependent on uh, the choice of the sample point which is computed. A small variance would indicate uh, indeed that the, uh, the parameter has in the independent effects uh, compared to other parameters. So this can then be all plotted uh, in one graph and this is the graph we see here. So we calculate the mean effect versus the variance effect. And so we notice that we have some parameters that have uh, large, uh, small mean and small variance. So these are non-influential parameters. They have essentially no effect and their variation is very little. Then we have uh, some parameter that is, um, here has a large mean but medium variance. And then we have a parameter that's large mean and large variance. So typically what is said is that we categorize that into uh, negligible effect, something that has very small mean. And then we have also uh, linear effects versus interacting effects. So remember, if the mean is large, but also the variance is large, then, then there are other things happening than that parameter just having an effect. Uh, there are probably interactions with other parameters uh, such that we create this large variance. So when the variance is very small, then often we uh, think about more linear and additive effects. I'd like to make a small note about interactions. Uh, it's often a poorly understood uh, concept. Uh, 
And so to do that, um, let's say that we'd like to, uh, with this simple uh, example, illustrate how interactions work. So let's say that we are testing some kind of material, and the material is, uh, it could be, say, a rock. And this material is tested at various temperature and for various composition of the rock. So this would be the temperature effect and the compositional effect. And so um, we take uh, simply a simple uh, fact, uh, factorial design here uh, where we have two temperatures and two, uh, essentially, two compositions. So in total, I can make uh, four, uh, combination of four. So this is a level of minus one means low and one means high. So once I run my test, I run my test four times, I, I go into the lab and run my test and, and I find the strength of that material in terms of megapascal and I find these. So the question now is, what has the largest effect? Is it temperature or is it uh, composition or is it a combination of temperature and composition? So to do that, uh, we're looking here at, instead of A and B, we're looking at A times B. So here, minus one times minus one is one. 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, et cetera, et cetera. So now, just as before, we can uh, calculate these effects. So as we notice here, the effect of x, uh, the temperature, is simply the response, if you look at the previous slide, the responses of temperature when temperature is high, on average, minus responses of temperature when temperature is low. So that will be then the effect. And as we notice, the biggest effect comes when we're looking at when the combination of x, y is high, uh, which is this effect in the combination of x uh, when x is low is this effect. So we notice here that this combination here has the largest effect. So it's the temperature interacting with the composition that has an effect, not so much the temperature itself or the effect itself. And so later on, we'll extend this idea of this product because here an interaction is just modeled through a product. And we'll see later on that's just uh, one way of modeling interactions that actually modeling interaction is much more sophisticated than such product. The takeaways here uh, for the screening techniques is that they're really good at providing rapid insight uh, into the parameter of influence. Uh, they have to be, we have to be a little bit careful in, 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 in uh, interpreting and really as quantitative uh, measures. There are significant um, limitations. It doesn't often deal with interactions very well, requires a single response. Uh, doesn't deal very well with discrete uh, input parameters, um, et cetera. So, so often these can be used as a precursor uh, to, uh, to global sensitivity analysis method where we could possibly study things that have absolutely no effect at all. And we can say that uh, with, with uh, significant confidence, uh, confidence quite rapidly. Just to show you that, let's return to this uh, case with the, uh, the shallow geothermal. Remember just shallow geothermal, we're interested in designing a heat pump and looking at what happens to the temperature decline as we're injecting heat into the subsurface. And so, and then, and then uh, regaining that, that, as, uh, that, that heat later on. So we had a whole bunch of parameters. Um, and so uh, we can do a Monte Carlo based uh, sensitive analysis and that's global sensitive analysis. But we can also look um, a priori a little bit at the local sensitivity analysis. Here we see the result of a local sensitivity analysis. So in this local sensitivity analysis, we did two things. We said, let's first fix the gradients, which is a one-hour time analysis, and let's vary, uh, fix the hydraulic connectivity, that means the geology, and let's then vary the gradient uh, of the water, the basically the water flow gradient in that system. We vary that, and we see an effect. It's not, it's not that everything stays constant. And we can do the reverse. We look at the fixed gradient and then change the uh, the permeability hydroconnectivity, and so again, we could see a variation. So that's encouraging in the sense that uh, that these both are probably sensitive to the response. And the response, remember, here's the delta T over time. So in global sensitivity analysis, uh, we'll take the previous table and just do Monte Carlo uh, by varying all the parameters, and we get all these responses. And then from those responses, uh, we will be investigating, uh, making, again, some kind of a Pareto chart that says this is an important parameter and this is a less important parameter. So we see here again that gradient, as well as uh, hydraulic connectivity parameters are coming out as important. So that confirms a little bit what we already sort of knew with local sensitivity analysis.